I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this policy forum, full, equal, meaningful, and safe, creating enabling environments for women's participation in Libya. Many thanks to the government of Finland for their support for this project. This is uh, part of our Women, Peace, and Security program. Women, Peace, and Security agenda is broadly understood to include four pillars. Participation of women in all aspects of the maintenance of peace and security, prevention of armed conflict, protection of women and girls from violence, and gender responsive relief and recovery in conflict affected contexts. Each, um, I think we can all recognize that each of these pillars has an important role to play in the WPS agenda, but um, regrettably engagement on each of the pillars has been largely disconnected with little focus on the relationship among them. The specific ways that women's full, equal and meaningful participation is impacted by violence and violent threats uh, have not been fully considered up to now. This risk perpetuating a false binary between the participation of women as leaders with agency and the protection of women as victims. And it overlooks the critical link between the threats and harms women experience and their relatively low levels of political representation. Of course, how this dynamic manifests itself differs depending upon the specific context, but certain patterns across context can be identified and merit further study. Today's event serves as the launch of IPI's latest policy report by Catherine Turner and Aisling Swain, uh, which I can, Howard, I got a, I got a photo out for you. <laughs> there I go. Okay. Uh, Howard, a longtime photographer, is back there. Um, creating enabling environments for women's participation in Libya. This report is the second in our series on protection and participation following our 2021 publication on Northern Ireland. As uh, we will see, there are commonalities in the barriers to protection and participation found in both contexts, but there are also considerable differences based on the two distinct political contexts. But it's also uh, important to know that this dynamic is not limited to active conflict contexts or even post-conflict settings. Women in public life regularly face violent threats aimed to suppress their full, equal, and meaningful participation uh, this is true in the developed world as well as the developing world and uh, even here in New York in the multilateral setting where recent attention has been placed on the need to protect women briefers to the Security Council from the threat of reprisals. This is an issue that deserves all of our close attention. So we have a great panel to discuss all of this and thus without further ado, I'll pass the floor to my colleague, Dr. Phoebe Donnelly head of IPI's Women, Peace and Security program, who will moderate the discussion today. Phoebe, thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to all of you here in person, as well as to our online audience today. As Adam said, my name is Phoebe Donnelly, and I lead our Women, Peace and Security program at the International Peace Institute. It is truly an honor to be on a panel with the women, both here virtually, as well as the women sitting next to me. I'm really looking forward to guiding our discussion today. The way today will work is I will pose an opening question to each of the speakers. They'll give a few remarks, and then we will turn the, to open the floor for a Q&A. So start thinking of your questions now. We'll have questions from our in-person and virtual audience. So to kick us off with the comments, as Adam mentioned, we have the reports in the back. And we have the authors of the report. Catherine Turner is a professor of international law and the deputy director of the Durham Global Security Institute at Durham Law School. And her co-author, Ashling Swain, is a professor of gender studies in the School of Social Policy, Social Work, and Social Justice at the University College Dublin. They will be joining us virtually. Hopefully we'll get them up. Okay. So 
Catherine and Ashling, can you provide an overview of your findings on the nexus of women's participation and protection in Libya? What is the relationship between these two pillars? And what does it mean to create an enabling environment for women's participation in Libya? The floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Phoebe. Um, and thank you to you and to um, everybody at IPI for all the support for this work over the past number of years. Uh, we're really, really pleased to be launching the report today. And we're really sorry that we can't be there in person. <laughs> um, so hopefully, hopefully uh, next time. So um, I wonder, can I share my screen here? Um, Okay, so as Phoebe uh, has mentioned, this is um, the second report that we have done um, in which we are considering the relationship between participation and protection in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, and in the first uh, report, we used Northern Ireland um, as a case study. And from that report, uh, what we found was this circular relationship between uh, participation and protection whereby participation in processes and institutions of peace and security made women visible because of the very small numbers um, of women in leadership positions in those sectors. This visibility in turn exposed the women to risks that were directed at them specifically because of their work. And the threats then had an inhibiting impact on women's willingness to participate thereby reducing the number of women participating in these institutions or wanting to participate in these institutions. And this circular relationship between participation and protection raised the need for further research really on how best to address protection related barriers to participation under the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And so the previous research also highlighted the way in which the participation and the protection pillars of the agenda have evolved along separate tracks. Uh, with attention only recently turning to the relationship between the two. And so in the report that we're launching today, um, we are considering the impact of international frameworks and international actors on women's experience of participation. Mm. And so one of the aims of um, one of the aims of Resolution 1325 um, was to ensure that women, peace and security commitments were mainstreamed across the work of the UN system. And so here we use Libya as a, an example of a case where women, peace and security commitments have been incorporated into the mandate of a UN political mission and have influenced the ways in which international actors have approached mediation support and women's participation in the political process in Libya. And so by examining the ways um, in which participation and protection um, have been framed uh, in the Libya resolution, this allows us to understand how the relationship between the two is understood by the Security Council. And this then in turn allows us to compare the approach of the Security Council with the experience of Libyan women themselves and to ask whether adopting international frameworks is helpful or whether it can expose women to different forms of threat and risk. So turning first to participation then, the report evidences how international support uh, for women's participation in Libya has evolved over time. So while the Women, Peace and Security commitments um, have been included in the UNSMIL mandate from the outset, the nature and the extent of international support for women's participation has increased significantly over time. And this mirrors broader trends in the agenda internationally. So support has grown to include not only calls for women's representation in high level processes, but also a much broader range of mechanisms at track 1.5 and track two to support women's civil society and to make connections uh, between the political process and women's organizations. But as these efforts to increase women's participation have grown, there's been increasing evidence and acknowledgement of the risk and high profile cases of, of women being targeted for participating and through the adoption of language in the Security Council Resolution 2467 here um, that acknowledges that women's participation and their protection are inextricably linked. OK, so inextricably linked and mutually reinforcing. So um, turning first to participation, we had two insights to emerge from the research, um, both of which cast light on the significance of Libya for further understanding the participation protection nexus. 
So the first was that efforts to promote participation were perceived by women to focus primarily on the high level uh, participation in elections and in the political process. And this approach was seen as being um, driven by international priorities rather than those of, of um, all Libyan women themselves. And so in particular, many participants in the research were skeptical about the use of quotas for women's representation in, in political bodies. And there were a number of different reasons for this. So the, um, the idea that quotas were intended as window dressing to satisfy international um, audiences and international women, peace and security requirements. Um, that even when women were elected, the structural conditions meant that they weren't given decision making or leadership positions in which they could make change. Or that quotas favoured some politically connected women at the expense of women's civil society more broadly. But it, it was the targeting of women participating in these high level processes that first drew attention to the risks that women were exposed to. So women peace and security policy encourages visible participation in these processes. And often that participation is celebrated internationally, but the visibility exposes women to risk that has uh, that have been treated as exceptional, um, but isn't covered in the protection side of the Women, Peace and Security resolutions. And as a result, these high profile examples of direct forms of violence against women have framed thinking on the nexus between participation and protection. So casting it primarily as a matter of security and encouraging a securitized response to protecting participation. But the second insight was that many women felt that insufficient attention was paid to barriers to participation at the local level. And over time, and um, with the agenda, greater attention has been paid to the different ways in which women contribute to peace and security, including through informal processes and in their own communities. And so the expansion of the idea of participation has begun to take hold. But something of a blind spot remains when it comes to understanding how it can be supported in conflict affected contexts. So many of the barriers that women cited were protection related, but these were described as risks that prevented women from taking on public roles or roles outside their homes and families. And so if a broader definition of participation is to be properly supported, then a greater understanding of what prevents women from taking on leadership roles in the first place is going to be necessary. And so from the research, a distinction uh, emerged between the idea of security as something that's provided by states or by institutions and risk as something that ar arose much more organically. Risk was context specific and could only really be properly addressed by understanding local dynamics. And it was here that there was a significant gap between how the international frameworks conceptualized protection and how women described what they needed. And so as thinking on participation has evolved, the nexus with protection has become even clearer. But thinking on protection in this context hasn't caught up with the specific nature of protection related barriers to participation uh, that we identified and addressed in the report. So Ashley, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Thanks to IPI and everyone there. And again, sorry, I wish we were there. It's just personal um, factors that unfortunately didn't allow us to travel. Um, I'm going to pick up on from where Catherine left off and part of your question, Phoebe, that asked us about enabling environments. As Catherine has outlined, um, you know, trying to understand these protection related risks um, became really apparent um, in the context of the research. And, um, you know, it also struck us when we were formulating uh, the research itself and, and working with researchers from the context that we also, along with Resolution 2467, have wonderful language in, and commitments in Resolution 2493 that calls for the creation of enabling environments for women's participation. And as we were, you know, hearing what women were telling us about their experiences of risk and, and insecurity and threat, that was you know really impacting not just their ability to participate but the experience of participation when they did we started to wonder whether we could contribute to try and unpack as researchers and um, what it would mean to create enabling environments for women what women told us through their experiences um, was that they were experiencing as Catherine had, has outlined and I'll go into in further detail, is direct threats. So those coming from state and non-state actors and those affiliated um, with, with kind of political actors and indirect threats, which was this familial and social context related barriers, which Catherine has mentioned. 
we found overall that women were talking about layers of risk and insecurity that they were experiencing from their home right up to national levels and then these the global and international frameworks as Catherine has mentioned. And um, when we were looking at this, it, it struck us um, that there's multi layers here of risk that we're not quite capturing properly um, as policymakers, as practitioners, and that civil society are very aware of in, in Libya and certainly um, in Northern Ireland, as we found there as well, and working on this actively themselves. And as researchers trying to figure out, well, how can we better understand these layers and then respond to them? And for those of you who work on violence against women programming, you may have heard of a tool called the socio-ecological framework. It's basically a way to map out all the layers where contributory factors arise towards violence against women. And we use that to try and capture all the things that women were telling us in this research about where um, violence and risk arises. And it's there on the right hand side of the slide. We've mapped this out as a framework to show us where protection related barriers and risk arise for women who are electing to participate um, in leadership positions in public. From the individual, interpersonal and community levels where dynamics such as shame and sullying of women's reputation are preventing women from being able to public, publicly participate. Threats and risks to their families, um, which certainly was having huge impact on women themselves. Then right up to the national level where laws and policies don't enable um, the kinds of legal environment for women to uh, deal with kind of risks that were targeted at them and to live full and, and free lives, if you like. And then state actors themselves who were curbing women's participation, societal norms, gender inequalities, stereotypes that inhibit the idea that women would take on public leadership roles, and then the global institutional frameworks and how they're being interpreted in that context. So we think and hope that um, this framework helps us to see if this is the layers of risk and barriers that women are experiencing as they try and participate in public, then as policymakers, as actors, and, and for the WPS agenda itself, Here's a way to try and understand what the environment is for women's participation and therefore how we might go about trying to promote enabling environments for women's participation. There's a quote there on the slide at the end, um, which I think encapsulates it all. One of the women um, in the interviews told us, um, as you can see outlined here, that for those issuing threats to them, they're trying to protect an ecosystem of society in which men have entitlement to participate. It's just the natural and normal way. Um, and that when women step out of the breach, if you like, and, and come forward and lead participation, lead in participation roles, that the threats and risks are trying to push women back into those roles and then prevent other women from coming forward. And so they understood it, and the women we spoke to, as an ecosystem in which certain entitlements and rights are available. And then we we're trying to present an ecosystem of where the enabling and disabling factors for women's participation are and how to understand them. Next slide, please, Catherine. And just what this all really tells us um, is that women are living with the anticipation that there is going to be threat and risk to their participation. It will emerge in different ways. It will be attacks on their reputation and um, inequalities within the home and home place about whether they should or could be stepping outside of family roles right up to national and global levels. Um, and that really important for the WPS agenda as it moves forward is to recognize the relationship um, that, that the relationship between participation and protection needs to be more fulsome, recognize that range of risks and the layers and levels and try and take that into context and on, um, as we kind of promote women's participation, if you like. We're keenly aware that it's not one UN mission or one organization that takes this on and fixes all these layers. It's more that as we think about in the policy world and particularly at global levels, uh, promoting women's participation, it's not just expanding protection, so it's not just conflict related sexual violence. It's taking this whole enabling environment and understanding the context in which women are choosing to participate, the choices they're making and what might be in the background for them. It is their environment and how do we make that enabling? And, and this is just one way to try and understand it. And finally, as we're trying to promote with this um, piece of research is you know what we heard from women and what the research shows is that yes, we need to promote women's full, equal and meaningful participation, but it also needs to be safe. So we need to be pushing forward full, equal, meaningful and safe participation under the WPS agenda and as we bring the pillars together. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Catherine and Ashling. This was really helpful. And that last slide, I think, really helps me to kind of hone in on some of the language, as well as the title of the report, Full, Equal, Meaningful, and Safe, and this idea of context-specific protection-related barriers to participation. So if you walk away with any phrases from, from their presentation, I think those are some I would like to highlight. We'll now turn to our next speaker, Hibak Osman. She is the founder and CEO of Karama. And Hibak, can you tell us more about your work with the WPS agenda and what dynamics, patterns, and challenges you have countered in your role? Uh, we have to understand that uh, 1325 is not, uh, it's not binding. It's at the discretion of governments. So many governments, if they are not at war, certainly in the Middle East, they don't think this is a priority. So they have never really put it as a priority. And, um, you know, the success of the, of the Women, Peace and Security in 1325, of course, it depends on, uh, you know, on the participation of civil society. So having governments not seeing this as a priority, it has basically left it for the civil society and the women's organizations. The, what is lacking, of course, when governments, of course, are not, um, are not uh, in support of this or don't see this as a necessary, they don't, there is no political will. So the major problem is uh, the lack of implementation is because of the political will. And the second thing is 1325 says that governments should put resources aside for women to participate. Now, tell me any government that's really willing to do that will put money in so women can participate. So these are two major problems. So the other question is, who has then bought this agenda uh, in the Arab region? It's the women civil society. The first countries that have really tried to tackle this is Iraq and Palestine. And it was the women's organizations that had really, you know, put this on the agenda and they were able to bring two things together a detailed understanding, because it's not just good enough to say, if governments are saying this is not a priority and we are not at war, so why are we talking about 1325? So it was the women's organizations who really put this on the agenda, 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. They had a detailed understanding of it, so at least they can win you know, the, the, uh, the people an understanding. And the other thing was, they have to look at this, 1325 and Women, Peace and Security, and, and see exactly and explain how important it is uh, to their society. So it was an appreciation for the local needs and priorities and what the agenda can do for their context because it's, it's not good enough to just take this agenda and say, we need to do, you have to explain it and explain also the relevance of it to the work of, uh, of the women's organizations. Women in civil society have built broad coalitions invested in development and implementation of and monitoring of the national action plans. They have put on the political agenda and built the political will. So even though the governments were not supporting, they were able to bring a lot of women together in a coalition to push for that and to make sure that it is on the political agenda. Um, they, so it wasn't really easy. They had a lot of uh, problems because there was absolutely, the, the national action plans were not probably resourced. There was absolutely no resources for it. Localizing the agenda has succeeded in helping communities understand why and how the women peace and security agenda is relevant to them. It's not a foreign agenda or that it is undermining local communities. And that's exactly what we have been hearing that every time there comes an agenda, you know, governments and others would say, no, no, this is a foreign agenda. So therefore you need to build a constituency for that. And I think this is where the women have really succeeded to build a con constituency for the women peace and security agenda, to put it on the political agenda and to make, to, to, to also make the community understand that this is relevant to them and their everyday life. So that, that is how it is, but then we have to look at it and say, okay, where's the failure? If you, I was just listening to Livia and I was wondering, you know, what, uh, it was very interesting uh, what, uh, you know, the report says. It has, um, the local political currents have resisted and painted women, peace and security as a foreign agenda. They made it into a political football. Civil society has not had the space or the opportunity to take the ownership of the Women, Peace and Security agenda and sell it to the local communities because they, the, the environment was not there 
and there was absolutely no support for them, unlike Iraq and Palestine, where the, where the women's civil society were able to build constituency that would push it to the political agenda. Um, what happened in Libya was, uh, was, uh, was a disaster because when the UN signed a memo with the Minister of Women's Affairs, the government came down and said, this is a foreign agenda, and it, they criminalized the women's peace and security agenda, actually, and threatened to put the minister in jail. So it was, um, you know, it, it was a total disaster in Libya. And the other country that has tried to use, paint it to, so that they can get um, a leverage with the international community was Sudan. Al-Bashir's government came up with a national action plan, wrote a glowing report without any consultation whatsoever. It was just basically for the consumption of the international community. And of course, it was even then it was rejected by the conservatives. So there was no substance and no consistency of it at all. Localizing the agenda, you know, making it relevant to the needs of people on the ground is also key to preventing the increasing security sizing of the women peace, and, uh, women peace and security agenda. The second point I want to bring in is focus on security. The focus on security is also undermining the women peace and security agenda. Women peace and security is a human rights agenda that was pioneered by women activists across the world. It is being undermined by a focus on security and the idea that implementing women peace and security simply means making war safe for women. Prevention and participation in conflict resolution are two pillars of the women peace and security agenda. It is no good to ignore these pillars in favor of protection and relief and recovery. That is not an agenda that is relevant to the society, it's only relevant to those who have an interest in conflict. Persecuting sexual violence in conflict is important, but preventing it in, uh, preventing it in the first place is preferable. It is meaningless for women to have a woman defense minister, a woman commanding officer, or a woman director of CIA, if women in those positions are products of the same institutions that have misserved women. We need to ask the question, is the military becoming feminized? or are the women becoming militarized? These are not the priorities that women's groups in the region are pushing for. They are decisions that strengthen the status quo and they benefit only the arms trade and those who are prepared to use violence as means of governing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Habak, for those very strong examples and people in the chat are already agreeing and chiming in. So thank you for those remarks. I'll now turn to Zahara Lange, who is co-founder and CEO of the Libyan Women's Platform for Peace. Zahara, can you share some examples of the work your organization has done to support women's participation in peace building and political processes in Libya. What are some of the best practices you have identified, identified to elevate these initiatives? Thank you, Phoebe, and thank you for um, this opportunity um, to be here to discuss this uh, new study by uh, IPI. Thank you, Catherine and Ashley. Well, uh, I think uh, um, there's a relief reading uh, this study after activism 12 years in Libya, specifically working on peace building and uh, losing many colleagues and friends uh, who were at the forefront in Libya, fighting uh, for a peaceful transfer of power, fighting for uh, inclusive transitions, uh, uh, we've uh, lost uh, many of our colleagues and uh, before even losing our colleagues, we were saying it's not enough to quote unquote empower women, we need to disempower warlords. This was our uh, motto for long ever since the 20. 12, um, year 2012, after seeing what happened after the, rev uh, the elections, that it did not stabilize the country, that uh, violations, atrocity crimes continued, especially against uh, the, the most marginalized, and I would not say women only, and this is part, maybe I'd have 
a problem here and I need uh, with this study it needs to be further nuance what women are we talking to maybe employing a more intersectional lens but because not all women when there's visibility uh, they are at risk some women if they are internationally recognized yes there's bullying cyber bullying everything but that kind of visibility especially internationally it becomes another kind of um, um, uh, a protection. So, and I can't say it's either that or uh, it's both ways. And that's why uh, in an earlier um, uh, 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 study I've done an article, I called it the gender paradox. Uh, women in Libya were at the forefront participating um, uh, in, looks like they're enabled, empowered, but they are being targeted. But then even that needs to be further examined because what women and at what participation level? Because, and that's, I think, is another um, nuance that needs to be introduced is the participation at the national level uh, same as the participation in local traditional um, uh, mechanisms of peace building, uh, I think uh, there's a great difference. And here I would like to refer to a study um, uh, again by IPI. I just checked it. Uh, I remember that study and that triggered a study that I had to do for ONSMIL and UNDP to basically debunk the, what I think were baseless um, uh, assumptions in that study. Sorry to say that, but I think this study um, uh, has walked uh, any, uh, uh, maybe it's, it was called from the ground up, uh, UN support to local mediation. That was back in 2018. In that study, and I quote, it, it said that, Women's mediation and local reconciliation does not feature in Libyan customs. And that international community, that was uh, the recommendation in that study uh, back in um, 2018 by IPI, that international community must respect their tradition, be realistic, and deal with the actual stakeholders. You see? So that study. It made us, as a movement, and you're asking, to focus on the invisible woman. They're there, but they are not visible by uh, uh, in front of the international community, international studies. And they, their level of protection is much higher because of the, the, uh, 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 the the uh, to use the the terms here is the the ecological systems the traditional ecological systems and we've done uh, studies on that on the participation of local women mediators with USIP with the CDRC uh, our um, uh, Libyan Women's Platform for Peace focusing on that kind of participation and here you see that women's participation is grounded in traditional uh, customary mechanisms and local contexts. So the assumption that, and that's what I worry when I hear this study, uh, there's something as if it says we should take from the agency of women in the name of their protection. We should not uh, allow, uh, make them visible. We should not, um, uh, um, and, and you, uh, here the authors can correct me, but I'm getting that. Uh, yes, we need to introduce measures of protection. We have always been saying we need to um, uh, strengthen the synergies uh, and end the silos between the pillars of the WPS agenda, participation, and uh, protection, but what? We need to unpack everything. What participation and what protection? Protection by who? And that protection, the do no harm, should not take away from the agency of Libyan women. The other aspect is here, I feel the, 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 the whole 
study is focusing on only one aspect of a participation, uh, which is representation. Yes, it talks about the meaningful, uh, equal, full, uh, safe participation, but what about other questions? And this is what we have been uh, working on is the questions, not only of who, the question of representation, but the question of what. What agenda are we bringing to, to the table? What is the feminist, the community-based, the bottom-up approach that women who are participating, whether on the track one level, uh, national level, uh, the local level, are bringing to the table? Um, one last thing I think, and it needs to be addressed. Yes, we've discussed uh, the importance of um, um, uh, protection. Another aspect that is missing as a whole, and I think Hibak has alluded to it, is the question of accountability. That needs, yes, here talks about the responsibility of everyone, but it's not enough. We need to think about accountability. And accountability, it's not only of uh, uh, um, local national stakeholders, but also of internationals. And especially if we're talking about peacekeeping, peace, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the accountability of those who spoil, who go again, uh, who commit the atrocities, the violations, including those from the international systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sahara. And thank you for kind of think, encouraging us to unpack everything and have some of these challenging and complex conversations. I think that's a, a real value add to this and we really welcome that. I'm gonna to turn to our next panelist who will also be joining us virtually, I believe from Libya. She is the Senior Gender Advisor and Chief of Gender Equality Section at the United Nations Support Mission in Libya, Nada Darwaza. And Nada, I wanted to pose to you the question, how does the UN mission in Libya engage with the connection between protection and participation on the ground? What are the main challenges faced in advancing gender equality in Libya? And how does UNSMIL address these challenges and its work? Over to you, Nada. Right, thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, IPI, for inviting me. And congratulations, Catherine and Ashling, for the report. Um, let me just basically just remind everybody um, about what sort of a mission the UN uh, uh, mission um, to support uh, the UN mission uh, support in Libya. Um, we are a political mission, and it's and working in an integrated uh, configuration, which basically means that it's us and other UN agencies working collaboratively to move forward with the political uh, uh, development and perhaps moving from conflict to post-conflict to perhaps a more settled um, uh, political environment, democratic transition. And to, we try to support <clears throat> the developmental and humanitarian aspects as well. So saying that, I'll just zoom in more to the UNSMIL mission and just basically again tell you that the UNSMIL mission is not merely the political um, services, but we also have the gender advisory services, we have the human rights services, we have the security institution services and the electoral services. And one of the things that we work with, we insist on doing is basically making sure that there are synergies, there are messages that are similar and that are with a unified voice and basically ensuring that gender is a cross-cutting element that <clears throat> the discussion on gen gender equality. And here I would tend to basically focus on something. Gender is a term that is rarely understood in many of the um, region. And, and basically what we try to do is, again, to unpack what does that mean? Gender equality is understanding the role, the value of both women and men in a certain society. And we are using this term instead of 
a very, um, to a large extent, unoperationalized term that is gender. So we basically work to make sure that all the messages coming out from the mission, from the SRSG and from any other section working with any other Libyan actor are the same in terms of not compromising our model of inclusion of women, our model of making sure that um, uh, women rights are respected. And here I would like to confirm what Zahra has just said in relation to what is our understanding of political participation. While I absolutely agree and while we all push for it that political participation, the, the, the top of it is basically making sure that women are there, are being represented in political dialogue. And I think Zahra was one of the people who were in part of the LPDF, the Libyan political dialogue, but also to make sure that initiatives happening at the grassroots level where women are engaged, are also recognized as political activism, as political representation, and as worthy contribution to the development of Libya. I want to move quickly, basically, to respond to some of the key challenges about what we've seen. I've been here for a year, and let me tell you, I could cluster the key challenges, notwithstanding the political um, um, complexities, notwithstanding the um, several armed groups that are operating across Libya. Um, um, but there are other issues that are worth considering, which hampers, in my opinion, women actual and meaningful participation in political, official political um, discourse. Um, one is the mo women movement themselves. And I think this requires a lot of research, perhaps a lot of discussion. Who are the women that are um, discussing women empowerment or discussing women uh, human rights? And I think we there is a wide spectrum in Libya. Um, there are the women that Zahra has been mentioning who are actively engaged at the grassroots level. They are not always interested in uh, engaging in the political dialogue. And to some extent, I may perhaps disagree with some of the findings of the reports. In our case, notwithstanding the security or the protection issues, since I've arrived in here, the number of women who calls, who tries to basically engage, who tries to say that we are the ones who should be in any political dialogue is huge and is varied from all parts of Libya. So perhaps different perspective, different opportunity to meet with different women. But again, there is this problem about the defragmentation of the women movement. On many occasions, women movement are not happy to work together. And I'm not really um, um, basically generalizing this finding, but I can see it very clearly in some of the actions. There is a, a strong defragmentation of the women movement. And there is also this information and weak knowledge about what is um, the, what, what is the women agenda? Um, what is the women peace and security agenda? What is um, women's rights? And I think that is also captured by the social and cultural structure of the country, which I have worked with other Arab countries or other countries in the Middle East region, and they would have a similar ambiguity about what are these, which allows for a lot of misinformation and, and, and allows for attacks, basically. Another problem, another key challenge is the weak institutions. Institutions, I mean, we have official institutions, most notably the um, the women, uh, min the state minister for women's affairs, who following the attack she received when she signed an MOU with UN Women to develop a national action plan on women, peace and security, was severely attacked and was severely uh, strained from doing any further work to the advancement of women. There's a weak policy and legal framework. Up until now, there is no strategy for the advancement for women and no legal framework to protect women up until now. A draft law for the protection of women from violence is being going back and forth and is also, in my opinion, 
a victim of the um, uh, disparities and conflict between women movements and women activists. There is, of course, the wider resistance by political actors, by key political actors, decision makers, regardless of whether some actors approve of their presence or not, but these political actors are there, are visible, they control the decision making in the country, and the political actors are not very supportive of gender equality matters. And there is the wider society who basically considers any space that the women may have would eventually uh, uh, threaten the existing power structure of male females in the society and threaten the equilibrium that they perceive that is happening in this country. I need to stop now because I passed my time, but I'm happy to respond to any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nada, and thank you for sharing about the dy dynamics you're seeing on the ground. Last but not least, I am going to turn to Sarah Taylor, Policy Specialist at UN Women. And just a reminder, after Sarah talks, we'll open it up to Q&A, so have your questions ready. Sarah. Where do international normative frameworks stand in relation to this discussion? And how do they approach the link between protection and participation? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I was in the enviable position of being at the end and sort of reflecting on what people have said. And if you've seen me here, I've just been frantically taking notes because I have so many thoughts and ideas that are veering a bit off piste of what I've been asked to discuss. Um, first, I really wanna congratulate Ashling and, and Catherine for the report. Um, I'm so glad that you've done it. Thanks to IPI as well for writing this. I think a couple of sort of framing thoughts as, we, um, as I begin, and I will try not to take too much time. Um, so just as Hibak was saying, um, the evolution, the development and the evolution of the woman peace and security agenda um, came out of lived experiences of women facing conflict affected situations at every level of their community and society. These four pillars have developed out of a necessity to be more specific about things like participation, about protection, about relief and recovery. But unfortunately, what ha that has meant at this sort of institutional level, as we've seen, is that they have indeed become siloed, as many of us working on this agenda have complained about for many years. And I think we're at the stage right now, and one of the reasons I really appreciate the work being done in this report is that it is working on knitting these pieces back together, right? So that we understand how participation and protection, for example, as this conversation today, are inextricably interlinked. Um, and that we can't actually make progress on this agenda until we get these pieces knitted back together. The other piece I wanna pick up on is the ecology idea. And I'm gonna take that in a slightly I'm gonna, I'm gonna build on that and talk about the ecosystems that we really need to recognize, right? So we need to look at this sort of these layers, these intersecting layers that the authors have laid out, but we also need to look at the ecosystem of policy and practice, right? We can have great policy. If we're not looking at good practice, then we're not getting anywhere um, and vice versa. And also the relevant actors. And this gets to one of the points that I think we're talking about here today, which is that, and, and just as, as the authors have said, is that this is not solely about what the UN does in, in the mission in Libya. This is not solely about what the UN Security Council does. This is about the entire ecosystem, um, as these layers point out, and, and what then moving forward do all of these actors need to do, right? So there is responsibility of you know, when we talk about the, as Nada has said, about the um, the weak institutions, what is it that needs, what support needs to be uh, uh, provided and what political capital and political will needs to be built at the national level to strengthen those institutions. Um, certainly when we look at the sort of the normative background in the specific context of Libya, um, this is crucial. Uh, the EVAL law, the um, Elimination of Violence Against Women 
legislation has already been mentioned. It's absolutely crucial. Um, there's also a need to protect civil society, uh, civil society organizations, and 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 one of the suggestions is the adoption of legislation in line with Libya's domestic and international obligations. This is where we talk about that ecosystem of policy, right? There are international obligations that at the national level need to be brought in line. Um, uh, there are, I think, one of the really crucial points that I wanted to make, and that comes out, I think, in Libya, but also in every single conflict-affected country that we're talking about, is none of these efforts will be successful if we are talking solely about trying to, it, to, to facilitate women's full, meaningful, um, and safe participation solely in elite political processes. There, as as, our, as you've already said, women are doing this work. They're doing this work at every single aspect of their community. We have another report that came out last year on women's local mediation in the MENA region, um, you know, talking about the, the challenges and the roles that women play. Women are doing this work. And the only way that the work at the, the, the elite level will be successful is when we are talking about the transformation of support and um, uh, and protection for women's full participation, particularly at the community level, because that's where this, they're already doing that work there. Um, uh, okay. Um, the responding to, uh, to, I think that one of the key recommendations for moving forward is um, responding to evolving threats and evolving participation spaces. And so I'm thinking here about, you know, we as the international community, and I certainly lump myself in on this, um, are always sort of playing catch up in terms of where we're trying to provide space and provide participation opportunities for women um, and what the protection considerations are for them. And, and I think that what we're not grappling with sufficiently right now in Libya and in other spaces is online space um, and online threats and, and, and those being very, very real. And we can point to, you know, multiple other conflicts um, where, uh, where that's a reality. And so I think that we need to be very clear on, um, on, on, on responding not only to that, but to all evolving threats. Um, I wanna reflect a little bit on accountability because I think that this point around accountability is absolutely crucial. Um, accountability is one of the most political and thorny issues for the international community. So if we're talking about sort of where the, the normative framework stands, um, the normative framework is not strong enough on international accountability, on legal accountability. But I really want to flag this other form of accountability that uh, that Hibak brought up, which is um, I'm going to call it pinkwashing, which is the sort of facade of responsiveness to women's rights. In particular, you know, sort of having a woman's participation forum that is divorced from actual political negotiation, that is a box sticking exercise. And Zara and I know exactly what she meant when she went, because that is box sticking exercise, right? And so it is accountability to the true principles of the woman, peace and security agenda to women's rights um, and accountability to that core constituency, which leads me to my final thought. So ultimately what we're talking about here, and I just wanna say again, if you haven't had a chance to read the report, please do, because the, the authors really are looking at grappling with how, with how we actually really do this enabling environment. The shorthand of participation and protection is actually the need to grapple with deeply rooted, structurally embedded, intersexual, intersection, intersectional inequality, right? Um, and there is a shorter way to say that, and it's patriarchy, right? And so what we are really talking about here is, oh, that's my time. Huh? Um, exactly, just like that. But what we're really talking about here is overturning and addressing the, this, this deeply entrenched systems of patriarchy at every level. So I will stop here. Thank you, Phoebe.
Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for, for flagging the, the P word, the patriarchy here. Always good to put it out there, what we're talking about, right? So I am going, I have several questions, but I wanted to open the floor because I imagine there are a lot of questions from the floor and responses, and I really look forward to an engaging discussion. So Ben in the back has a microphone if anyone wants to, oh, and B as well. Okay, and Elena up here was the first hand, and then to Jennifer. We'll take maybe two at a time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this excellent event, fascinating panel. Um, it's just so important and so good to hear all of you speaking truth and sharing all of your different perspectives. Thank you also for the amazing report. Um, I wanted to just pick up a few points and ask a question on, you know, that tension between security, protection, safe, and participation. And I think it's something that we, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because when we were, and sorry, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm uh, from the Swiss mission. I'm the women, peace and security expert at the Swiss mission. And when we introduced the word safe as kind of the fourth word in full, equal, meaningful and safe participation in the UNAMA resolution this spring, we did have this reflection, you know, how are we going to make sure that this is not, you know, misused even to uh, qualify the participation and to, you know, use it against participation? Oh, we cannot provide the level of safety that we need. So uh, um, instrumentalize that. So I think it's really important that we discuss this and that we um, are very aware that uh, this is not how it's meant at all. Um, so. I wanted just to 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 say that um, I'm also really really impressed and, and happy that we're discussing the different nuances and the different spaces and and fora of participation how how different they are and I had a question on that and um, it's kind of linking to that quote that you mentioned in the presentation that threats um, and actual attacks against women close the door to other women to participate. And um, yeah, if any of you have some further reflections and elaborations, kind of where this is most acute, kind of, you know, can, can we identify a space or maybe a level of participation where attacks are in a way most successful preventing further participation? And, um, you know, is there maybe merit in looking at that? And then very happy we brought in the P word. And I think it's great because I'm sure you're all, um, already reading uh, the, the new agenda for peace policy brief. I just want to raise your attention that there we have it black and white that we need to dismantle patriarchal uh, power structures. So, you know, let's use that as a hook and, and follow up on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annalena. And we'll turn to Jennifer in the back row. And yes, when you ask your question, if you could please introduce yourself. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Jennifer. I'm at the uh, Permanent Mission of Malta to the UN as a gender advisor. So thank you, Phoebe, for such an excellent panel. And um, I, I, I think it's so important to get the regional perspectives, academic perspectives, activist perspectives. Um, it's, it's very helpful um, to hear that what works in one place may not work in another place and to figure out why, what the challenges are in each. And I, I, I suppose my question draws on Hibak Zahra's and um, Nada's comments around the importance of the substantive agenda. And in linking women's participation and asking how women's participation may not be an end in itself, um, but the importance of women's participation being linked to gender equality outcomes. And um, I think it was uh, Hibak who pointed to examples in Palestine and Iraq of having, of localizing the agenda, having a translational element of being uh, able to interpret and identify a substantive feminist gender equality agenda um, as a strategy for mobilization and strengthening the constituency between women and women's political participation and women's activism uh, at the grassroots level. And frankly, in the study, I heard a very similar message 
um, in the beginning, the authors spoke about the skepticism um, among the interviewees about this uh, international focus on women's political participation. And um, so I guess my question is, for those of, with um, familiarity with the situation in Libya, how, what is the substantive feminist gender equality agenda? How are local women's organizations and communities defining it? And what opportunities are there to bring those substantive elements into the political process um, at local, national, and international level? And which of those elements can we here in New York be most supportive of? Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I will read one comment that came in from our online audience. This is from Catherine Vitaliano, and she says, women are not a monolithic group. Thus, addressing women's issues requires a multifaceted approach that considers the unique needs of women across different demographics. Specifically, I would like to know how this report, and maybe I can broaden it to how your, each of your different areas of work, captures the experiences, needs, and agency of younger women. So we have three questions on the table. Maybe we will just kind of go down the line and then turn to our online participants to chime in on any part of those. So Zahara, if you wanna start us off. Thank you for these uh, great questions. Uh, I think, um, uh, there's th this great question on uh, the relation between um, protection, sorry, protection, safety, uh, and security. And I've been bringing this issue, especially um, uh, last month with the uh, launch of uh, um, the Women's uh, na uh, Action Plan, Global Action Plan for um, Prevention of Atrocities uh, and Genocide, which came from the Office of um, the, the Assistant Secretary for Prevention of uh, Atrocity um, uh, Crimes, and the responsibility to protect. And uh, when we come to the doctrine of responsibility to protect, uh, Libya stands out because it's where the first time we have uh, implemented and failed in the implementation of uh, R2P. And here, ex uh, especially when we are looking into the case of women after the intervention in the name of the protection of civilians, again, we need to unpack what do we mean by protection? Protection of whom? By whom? We've seen in the case of Libya that the entire population, civilians, and especially the most marginalized women, are neither safe nor secure, nor is the country uh, peaceful. So it, le it makes you think, what protection are we talking about? And the whole idea of protection was transferred into interim, illegitimate, corrupt, interim governments and warlords who are enabled internationally. So that's when we're discussing, this is a further nuance, what protection, by whom, of whom. Uh, so this was, uh, I think, something that I, um, I didn't have time to, um, to, um, uh, to address. The other issue of substantive agenda, and you use the, the term feminist, and I remember myself, I said feminist agenda, and then I said community-based agenda, bottom-up agenda, inclusive agenda, whatever works and relates to our context, local context. Uh, and I think from our experience is that nobody definitely will care and you will continue to interview men and women of different ages 
they would not care that much for women to participate or not to participate. But if you ask that question also of men, they would not care if, uh, if they participate or not participate because it depends on, it's not a right. It, it, it's, it's what will you bring to the table? Uh, that's why I said the, and we need to be uh, representing really our constituencies. Uh, reflecting all men, women, uh, social leaders, uh, young, and to address the issues. And I will always say it's people-centered agenda. It's rights-based agenda, and not necessarily focusing on what our whatever our understanding of gender equality in a certain Western uh, context, uh, focusing primarily on um, sexual orientation, but. Uh, as um, uh, Nada has explained it, I think it's always matter how we present and speak uh, and amplify the real needs on the ground. And the other issue, because we mentioned the, the substantive agenda, uh, the what question, but we never address the big elephant in the room, which is how. How are we designing our peace processes? And how are we making sure that they are principled, that there is good governance, that they are transparent, that they are legitimate, that they are credible, and that their uh, 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 expediency is not comes before integrity. I think this, in the case of Libya, um, the women's bloc, uh, at the, uh, the LPDF, we were speaking about the normalization of corruption in, unfortunately, the UN peace process, and we exposed it. We took it up to the, um, uh, the Security Council. It was documented in the report of the uh, panel of experts. So I think that issues matter and make women's um, uh, participation matter. Um, I think I spoke a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sahara. Sarah, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, once again, I just have so many thoughts running around in my head and, and thank you, Sarah, for your, for, for your important points, I think. Um, you know, it's it's not just Libya, right? It is all of these other spaces and places with complex political conflicts that we're looking at where we see a, a sort of on the one hand um, touting of the importance of women's rights and women's participation in the moving forward for positive futures for these countries. And yet on the other, when you look at the slow grind of the political, um, uh, interactions that that exactly as you say we see that pattern being repeated over and over and over again in the name of sort of protection and safety and security the erosion of the very principles and governance structures that are meant to be upholding women's rights which we know is the way to build a long-term safe secure stable community so that 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 contradiction continues to perpetuate itself um, I do want to say just a very quick response to, to Jennifer, which is this idea of the skepticism of the international approach to the agenda, which is, of course, this repetition of top down as opposed to bottom up. And I think really this is a call to all the international actors, um, you know, UN included, but member states as well, regional actors, which is that you need to be in this for the long haul in terms of providing consistent, long term, reliable spaces and engagement and partnership with women at the local level so that you're building space for them to come together and, and feed into and guide and drive global sort of normative frameworks. Um, in terms of the online question regarding women are not a monolith, yeah, it's amazing how much we still need to say this. Not all women have the same opinions about everything. I know this comes as a total shock, right? Um, but I think that it's incredibly important when we talk about the sort of difference between asking women to have only one opinion or only one position on an issue 
and the need to bring and support a diverse women's movement together on particular issues, we need to get more comfortable with women disagreeing with each other and recognizing that that is not dangerous. That is important to recognizing and reflecting um, the diversity of women. And we, when we come back to protection and participation, I think, you know, the more we insist that women only have one uh, voice and perspective, the more that we, we, we are afraid of those disagreements um, that we put women at risk because they're, they're sort of out there alone um, if they have any divergent opinion, right? So anyway, just some additional thoughts for me. Um, so, um, you know, we don't want to replace international community to governments. So it seems like we're saying the international community should do this, the women, peace and security is coming from the West, all this and all that. When you have a country like Libya or let's say Somalia with really no real government as such, with all respect to Libya, it's very difficult to expect them to uphold the law because you know, everything goes. So if you're looking at, you know, and this is the reason why mobilization of women and building constituency and making sure they are, you know, I don't say educated, but they know the relevance. So let's say women, peace and security and protection and how that translates into their everyday life is very important, you see? So in a very, you know, you take these things in a practical way. You don't really wait for somebody to come up with a resolution. So, and in terms of women agreeing, when you are talking about protection, every woman agrees the protection of her family and her community and her, you know, children. So I, I, I do believe that really there is not much disagreement about protection of, of women. Participation is another, uh, you know, you can really say some women are already out there uh, participating and having, you know, and want to have an equal say and have a, you know, a, 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 a unique understanding of politics. Participation basically means, you know, men have failed or this government has failed. Therefore, women need to have their voice there. If you look at all the, uh, the peace agreements, when the international community insists that women should participate, the government say, you know, and the opposition say, great, and they bring, I don't know, their girlfriends or I have no idea, they're cooks or whoever they want to bring, and th these are women, but these are not, you know, these are not women who really understand exactly why they're there. Then when the international community says, okay, we're going to replace and say, we're going to create advisory board for Yemen. Then they bring this woman who are basically not at the table, but who are going to advise the envoy. You know, there is a lot of disagreement, what they are advising, who really, you know, selected this woman, what are their ideas, it's very complicated. But I feel like every time we are trying to replace our own responsibility to the international community, and then we turn around and we complain and say, this is a foreign agenda. So we have to find a way, it's complicated. Um, so again, I will really say, uh, you know, and I like the word elite, you know, every time a woman has a good idea and she seems to have, a, a, you know, kind of speak different languages, people, it's easy for people to say, well, this is really the elites, but let me tell you something. Those are the ones who really are, you know, working with the, uh, uh, the grassroots women and mobilizing them and have access. In terms of uh, women having feasibility, it's extremely important that women have feasibility. Now there are those who really want to have the, uh, what is it, uh, would have the me media briefs, uh, those who would be giving interviews and they are willing to take the risk. If you don't take risk and women and some women understand that you have to take a risk to do anything because if you, the other, you know, if you don't do that, the other, uh, what is it? Uh, the other choice is just to be quiet and be in your house cooking. So you take a risk knowingly. So it's okay, yes. And the feasibility actually protects you because you are a known person. So they will not, uh, you know, uh, they will think twice about to, 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 to make any problem. In terms of involvement of the youth, yes. Every, all these programs, of course, youth are the ones behind uh, uh, you know, um, um, they're very much involved in all of these movements and actually they're the ones who are behind the keyboards, they're the ones who are absolutely doing incredible campaigns for peace and protection for women, 
And, uh, you know, without them, I don't think any change is going to come in any of these countries that are going through, um, uh, through um, instability. So just in a nutshell, I would say you can't compare countries that are, you know, not stable to countries that are more stable. You know, those have the environment, they create the environment, women can do a lot. You know, what you have is that, that you know, like the 1325, many governments might not be willing to do that because they think it's, uh, you know, they interpret it in a way that we are not at war, therefore we don't need this, but it still did not stop the woman to really bring that to the political agenda and to make sure that there is national action plans and, a, you know, understanding for the communities and all that. Thank you. Thank you, Habak. I'm going to turn back to Catherine and Ashling, and then I will turn to Nada um, to expand, expand on any of these questions. And then just to flag this question of younger women and to see kind of if that was something that came up in your research, as well as the other questions and comments that have already been posed. Okay. Um... Thank, thanks very much, Phoebe. Um, so a thank you to all the panelists as well for your really thoughtful reflections on the report. Um, I have to say a lot of the questions that are coming up are, are questions that we've really grappled with um, over the course of writing this report. It's been a very long process. Um, the previous draft was twice the length that it is now. Um, and even that wasn't dealing with kind of all of the complexity of, of the data that we have. Um, so just on, on a few of the points, um, it was really clear from the interview data that that's there were these divisions and these differences of opinion um, within the kind of the women's movement itself around uh, you know this very question of what's the purpose of representation and who gets to speak on behalf of women and who doesn't, for example. And in a way, that's good because it demonstrated that we were seeing a variety of opinions and not just one particular view um, on you know what was the situation in Libya. Um, but in an, in another way, it sort of prompted a, a thinking for us around. Um, what is it um, or to whom do we want to speak um, with this report and to whom do we have authority to speak as well a little bit um, in relation to what was happening? And uh, Zara, you mentioned there the local mediation. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said to Ashley, do you know, um, we haven't spoken about med local mediation here. I wonder, you know, do we need to put that in? And the decision was that actually at this point, the report was being oriented towards um, international frameworks and international actors who may be shaping dynamics um, and that actually um, the critique, um, where, the, where the critique was going to be oriented was towards those international frameworks and not towards anything that Libyan women themselves were doing um, in that context. And that's why then it's it's appeared to focus on kind of that high level and, and the critique of, of the high level emphasis. And really that it flows from the idea that um, the Women, Peace and Security agenda itself is an external agenda that's operating in Libya and in some ways in positive ways and in some ways in, in ways that are making things more difficult. You know, and, and um, we, we've heard a little bit about the difficulties of, of using that language and some of the pushback against the language. Um, and I think one, one person in the interviews described it as ca causing chaos. And so we were really interested then in, in that dynamic. And what does that, um, in, in what ways does, uh, does that help women in Libya themselves with what they're trying to achieve and in what ways does it, uh, does it make things more difficult. Um, so I think, um, so I'm losing the, the thread a little bit here, but the um, the, the purpose was to, um, to try and convey um, the idea of complexity and the, 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 um, the need to, I think, um, understand that this is um, a, a separate dynamic, you know, that there's all these relationships within the country itself, there's relationships within the women's sector, there's relationships between women, um, with the women's, um, women's organisations and, and political organisations and governments as well, um, and that the external um, women, peace and security agenda plays its own sort of separate role in this. And in many ways, it's, you know, it's influential, it, it, it um, and when we talk about um, women's agency, particularly um, at the local level and the risk um, of kind of putting a, a protection lens onto what women are doing, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very strong um, proponent of local mediation and of women's local mediation as uh, kind of a, a way of addressing this, I think, because often what it can do is work within um, specific dynamics. It can work within uh, with a deep understanding um, of relational approaches and existing kind of uh, gender dynamics in, in it in a context in a way that's not context specific and so I think that um, from our position the women peace and security agenda can sometimes um, 
I suppose constrain that a little bit if you're having to describe your work in a particular language to get funded, if you're having to do things in a particular way to demonstrate that you are kind of advancing women's participation um, and that understanding kind of how this works um, and, and how this relates to the different spaces of participation um, and through through understanding it from the bottom up as well as from the top down is, is quite an important part of that. Um, and on the on the young women, yeah, we, we did hear quite a lot um, from young women as well um, around a sense of um, frustration, I think, primarily is, is what maybe came from those interviews around, um, I think, a gap between expectations, you know, in participating, particularly when, when participation was virtual, participating in those um, consultations um, versus what they felt really was achieved from it. Um, and so I think that that's uh, probably... Um, Again, a lot of these were kind of bigger problems that the agenda um, is, is trying to um, to come to terms with. But um, definitely young women um, felt that they um, they hadn't necessarily had the opportunities to be heard. And that that's something, um, as you say, an intersectional approach to this uh, would, I suppose, try to highlight more. Ashley, I'm going to pass over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Katja. And thanks, everyone, um, for the engagement and all the points that add depth to everything um, that, that we got to speak about, that, that some of which is in the report, a lot of it is not. Um, I think because of obviously scope and space and all the rest, but also because um, there's so much to unpack at different layers and, and everything you've all brought is just fantastic. So thank you. We're very much researchers looking at this and um, through this lens. One thing, I think we've only five minutes left and Nada needs to come in, um, is I just want to briefly respond to the piece on security, securitization and the risks of bringing in safety. I'm so glad you've all brought that up. I think that's so important and we definitely concur. And it's difficult because we were kind of, we did our last report in Northern Ireland and, and building on it with this with Libya. And I think we're coming out of the original research and into this, you know, at a certain point, Catherine and I kind of stopped in our tracks and went, oh no, you know, if we really are looking at bringing protection and participation together, what's going to happen because what has happened um, with kind of protection is it has become securitized. So conflict related sexual violence and that focus has been securitized, removing the things that Sarah brought our attention to, inequalities, structural inequalities, patriarchy, um, and that if we bring a protection lens to participation, what's going to happen is going to become securitized and you'll end up securitizing participation. Um, so there's a risk there for sure. And um, we have that really well mapped out, I think, in the Northern Ireland report. And, and have brought that to some degree in here, because I think and multiple things arise. And certainly in my experience of working in uh, different areas of the world, is what we've seen with the shift towards um, protecting, even say in humanitarian programming and violence against women programming, is that those who are the gatekeepers, whether that's internationals or, or local actors, become those who get to decide and determine whether me as a woman gets my voice heard or whether I get to participate and whether it's safe for me to do so, rather than understanding that I might as, as even despite the risks, I might still decide that I want to do this because that's my imperative, that though and I make my own safety assessment around that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of paternalism that informs how international actors behave um, in conflict affected contexts. And that informs programming. It informs also a safety mechanism to protect themselves um, from liability um, and to, to think on what they're doing. Um, and I think that all comes into play here into this conversation. And, and thank you all for bringing that up. I think that, you know, when we talk about safe participation and we talk about um, advancing participation in a way that's reflective of the environments we all live in, regardless of, of countries around the world, as, as was the point that was made at the beginning, um, you know, we're certainly not wanting a securitized approach. We're certainly not advocating for a safety participation that works out of the conversation, my choice to do this in the way I want to do from the local up to the, the national, you know, whatever that might be. In Northern Ireland, you know, it, it, and, and similarly in Libya, there are women participating, you know, like whether it's the public sector, we happen to focus more on the, the political and peace building here, um, whether that's at the local, whether that's, you know, all of the, the micro level stuff informally that's taking place. Um, and it's for us to be cognizant of risk and barriers that are gendered um, and to bring that into the conversation, but not to inhibit 
the choices I might make within my own understanding of those environments and then how I want to proceed in terms of participation, you know, it's if wherever I'm from. So, you know, I think for, for those actors in the room who raised this, particularly in the member states, that if it's really important that the debate is informed by a consideration of what safety might mean and who gets to decide what that is. And I think that's most important. So I'll stop talking in interest of time. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, to Nada to address any of those points or questions. Right. Thank you. A um, few points. I, I actually I want to talk about three things. One, um, I think international community, people who are um, basically developing UN resolution, us, the civil society, um, need to raise more the issue of what does political engagement means. And basically what we want is <clears throat> eventually a recognition that a woman in a local area managing to stop an armed conflict is as politically powerful as a woman sitting on a negotiation table. And I think this is something that we need to keep raising, we need to keep pushing for, so that the whole discourse in, in, in at the international level, at the national level, or at the grassroots level change. So I think this is a, a form of a struggle that we need to fight for. The second part that I want to mention, the second point I want to mention is, <clears throat> Again, I mean, we have this, you know, you would be talking to a decision maker and he would tell you, we have 25 women in the parliament, uh, only two of them are active. Well, the parliament has 200, 175 men and only three of them are active. And I don't know why we always need to basically say, I want a woman with a PhD, I want a woman who's a fully engaged in politics, she knows economics, she knows politics, she knows military, to be in a decision making. And then I, I will settle for a man who only reads and writes. And that you find it in the Middle East, somebody who's not engaged, somebody who's not interested. In my personal opinion, and this is what I keep fighting for, what I would really want is any woman to participate in any political forum at a local level, at a national level, regardless of whether she has an agenda for women advancement or not. She just have an equal right to basically be there in that forum and push for whatever she believes in doing. So I think, again, we are also in some areas fall into the issue of really judging women in a negative way because they haven't really pushed for a woman's agenda. It's not necessarily. What matters is that they're there. They're voicing themselves. And, and I think what we ought to work for is to create that environment where everybody has the right to be whoever he or she wishes to be or to engage in whatever they want to do. And this is what we fight for eventually. Now, the third point I want to mention is about, again, um, our understanding and our work of, of what we're doing as a mission, as a UN agency working in Libya. We listen to women and women approach us. We outreach to women. We try to link them with, you know, at different levels with the political division, with the security section. We're trying to link them with the SRSG if they want to basically, who, what I mean, whatever, a possible venue we can afford to bring these women and to listen to them, to listen to their concerns, to listen to what they really envision their role should be or what sort of protection they would need, we're going to work with them. And, and basically, we're going to amplify their voices in whatever we do. I mean, if we as the UN have the leverage of meeting decision makers, and again, regardless of their legitimacy, but they are the existing de facto powers in the country, then I would like to go there saying, well, you know, this is what women are saying. This is what women are demanding. And this is what we are trying to push you to do as well. Along with stop fighting, take out the arms, uh, do whatever. This is what women think they need at the economic level, at the grassroots level, at the political level. This is their vision of a government or a non-government. This is what women think. And I think we all need to push for that. I'll stop here. Thank you. I can give you 30 seconds. 
This is a recommendation. I think in terms of study, any study that's going to be done in a country should have a collaboration with the university there or think tanks. It's very important. The analysis will be different. The access will be different. I, and, and, and I highly recommend that. Yeah, I, I want to, I, I, can we answer? I know Catherine and Ashley, we, we have engaged with a local researcher and the, the ability to kind of name her and all of the dynamics in that um, became quite complicated, but I do want to flag Catherine or Ashling. I don't know if there's anything you want to say further about those partnerships and your university partnerships. It's in the report, but I do want to make sure we recognize that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we were very conscious um, of uh, being outsiders to this context, you know, I think we're both, um, you know, having done the research, particularly in Northern Ireland, which is our own backyard, if you like, um, we were very comfortable actually about looking at elsewhere. And, and um, I, I think we have Zorg's permission to uh, name her. She's here. Thank you, Zorg Amadi, who worked with us to do the research. She was a visiting fellow with um, Durham University and with Catherine and worked with us. Um, and it just that was a really important uh, part of this. Um, and you know, working with CARM as well at the um, in Beirut, uh, just really important stages of the process of getting guidance and working with uh, people from the region is important. And I think, you know, for us, the report is kind of a first look at here's a way to look at this and here's a way to think about this. It's very much, um, as we said, and stress this context specific learning and acknowledgement and ways of doing this is is what's important here. And and this, I think, is the start of a conversation. Um, that you know, I hope will open up space for people from the, the region themselves um, to think it and look at, look at this. I think themselves. Catherine, do you want to add anything? Yes, thank you. Sorry to cut you off, Habak, but I wanted to make sure we did get a chance to discuss that. Uh, you had a second point. But yeah, um, my second point is we cannot afford to have any woman to be in parliament or anything. Any woman who is not coming from a constituency, from women's movement from feminist movement has no place because it's really, I would rather not have any woman, you know, than woman who really doesn't know where her agenda is and who does not have a woman's agenda, which is of course, peace and security and women's advancement. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. And my friend Zahara promised three words and then we will release you. <laughs> it's the importance of co-production of knowledge. We cannot continue that the global north produces knowledge about us. Speak on our behalf. We are not only case studies. Thank you. I think this put a lot on the table. I know we could keep going. We could have a lot more questions. We had more questions online, but I want you to be sure to know that this is the start of many conversations. Please continue to, to the extent you can, stay here, continue to talk to our panelists. They're fantastic. So I want to thank them again for, for all of their remarks, for some of the, the tough discussions that we need to be having. Please grab this report on your way out. Also check out our Northern Ireland report, and hopefully we will be continuing this kind of research on the nexus between protection and participation in different areas. So thank you again and take care.